driver, mechanic, owner, champion. It doesn't matter what you label, he was always the best. If there's one person that defines the word legend in NASCAR Winston Cup racing, it is only one man. Today, on Men Behind the Wrenches, the story of Junior Johnson, the man some call the last American hero. To race fans and those within the walls of the NASCAR Winston Cup garage, he's larger than life. Perhaps no single person has had the far-reaching influence in the sport of NASCAR more than Junior Johnson. Hello and welcome to the men behind the wrenches. I'm Jeff Hammond. Junior nurtured the sport through 30 years of growth, from molding mechanics into crew chiefs and drivers into champions. And I bet you didn't know he introduced Winston to NASCAR. Through it all, Junior Johnson has lived a truly amazing life. Junior's roots go back to the early days of racing, when it wasn't an organized sport, but bootleggers testing just how fast their cars would run. Race tracks were just getting started. I basically was in the moonshine business when I was a young boy, and uh, somewhere in the 16, 17 year old, I, I, my brother wanted me to drive a car at North Wilkesbury as a fill-in for the Grand Nationals back then. And, I was at home plowing corn for my father with a mule. And he came down and asked me to go up there and drive his car in a race that they had uh, kind of put in place to entertain the fans while uh, they was waiting after qualifying before the race started. Speed was just something that I kind of fell into by being in the whiskey business. And uh, I went up there and of course uh, I was I tried to get by a good friend of mine, Gwen Staley, to win the race, and, a, and a, one of the other bootleggers, it was all a bunch of bootleggers racing each other, uh, got in front of me, and I run me up a bank and stuff, and I wound up finishing second, but that was my first introduction to racing, and, and uh, from that point on, I would occasionally go run a, a dirt track race for some individual local that had a car. Quickly, Junior's reputation as a win at no cost driver became well known. I was a young kid that didn't have no fear of nothing and uh, I guess I was uh, the one that everybody looked to to see how fast the car would run because the rest of them didn't have the nerve to drive. He was uh, a great competitor and uh, we were battling for the same turf and uh, as a result we we had uh, a lot of run-ins along the way and and uh, and it became a big rivalry and uh, and certainly a big challenge and uh, i always respected him through everything that went on on the racetrack but uh, we had some pretty good battles along the way to drive fast you had to work on the mechanics of the machine running moonshine junior had to outrun the law from the age 14 he was always looking for the mechanical edge it wasn't easy so sometimes you had to be creative. It was kind of trappy for a way. Uh, it, you know, we'd just grab a tree somewhere over with a big limb on it, throw a chain or it and hook a chain horse to it and pull a car up there and crawl underneath it. I was wondering if one of us hadn't got killed them, you know, dropping off, you know, breaking a chain or something, dropping on us. But it's just many, many items that made cars faster. And, uh, it intrigued me what made them run, and I was working on motors and all parts of the car when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, tear, tearing them apart, putting them back together. With all his experience on the back roads of the North Carolina mountains, outrunning revenuers, Junior easily started outrunning the competition on the racetrack. As the mid-50s approached, he was catching the eye of Ford Motor Company and about to turn to a career as a race car driver, when as he did some chores for his father, his whole world was turned upside down. My father had a still back over in the woods behind the house, and I'd been there about 30 minutes, and I heard something behind me. I didn't know what it was, and I looked around, and there's an ATU officer who was standing on top of a box fixing to jump right on my back. And of course, I just reached down and shoveled up a shovel of coal to go in the burner. I was fixing to throw it in the burner, and when I looked back over my shoulder and seen, you know, 
somebody fixing to jump on my back, I just give him the show and the gold and everything I could have. And we went off down across the side of the hill, and I was pretty fast on my feet. But I knew there was a fence down there, and there was a gate in it about 12, 14 foot wide. And I, I knew before I got there, I said, if I miss that gate, I'm caught because there's a barbed wire fence. And I knew I'd get tangled up in that thing. And it was dark. I didn't have a light or nothing. So I missed the gate one section, you know, just about 10 foot. And sure enough, I got tangled up in that barbed wire fence, and I got caught. In 1985, President Ronald Reagan would issue a presidential pardon to Junior. His past behind him, Junior was ready to build his racing legacy. As soon as Junior Johnson was released from prison, he headed to the track and picked up immediately where he'd left off, winning races. He quickly established his type of racing. I don't know if it's intimidating, but I don't think there's anybody misunderstand when I caught you I was going to pass. That was my style of driving. I didn't run you down and catch you just to play with you. I run you down and caught you to pass. I didn't intentionally try to wreck anybody. I went after them in the competition type way, and I guess a lot of them thought I roughed them up, but. I didn't go up there just to play around with them. I went up there to race. Well, championships weren't worth anything to start with. You know, you could win a championship and it's just a name. Winning all of the races you could win was more important because one race paid more than the whole championship did back in, basically. He was one of the guys, he and Curtis Turner and Fireball Roberts, because of their driving style. They were the ones who always, people came to see, they, they ran hard, they ran up front, and in doing so, they geometrically increased the probability they weren't going to finish. Their chances of blowing up or crashing were much greater than somebody who wasn't running as hard as they were. As a result, the old point systems never rewarded how you drove, drove as much as where you finished. Going into the 1960 season, Junior had been to Victory Lane 19 times, starting with the Daytona 500. He was poised for a career year. When I went to Daytona to drive the car, uh, uh, Ray Fox was working on it and he had two weeks to put it all together. And two or three times I almost got in my car and came home. But they kept telling me, you know, they'd get it better and we'll be okay in the race and stuff like that. And I kept fooling around for uh, finally the, it's almost time, you know, to start the race. And Cot Doins came whistling by me one time out on the racetrack when I was running. And when he came by, I just ducked over him behind him, and all of a sudden my car just whoop right up to him. And I sat down and run a couple laps, and I dropped off and come in. And Ray Fox, he he was tickled to death. He run over to the winner, and he said, "Buddy, we got this thing running now. We we're contender." I never said nothing to Ray about it. I never in my wildest dreams that I ever think I was going to hold on win the 500 race by doing that, but that's exactly what happened. I drafted them Pontiacs right down the tube until the last one of them went out, and I was sitting there so far ahead of the rest of them that I wound up winning the race. By 1966, Junior had won 50 times in the NASCAR Grand National Series. As a man who thrives on challenges, in his heart he felt he needed to find something new to conquer. I lost interest in it. And uh, I just I decided that this is enough. I went as far as I'm gonna go with this kind of atmosphere thing, so I quit. That's what I did as a driver. I won uh, 13 races last year I drove. And I probably would have won 15 or 20 if the motor hadn't blown up in the car. And I think we all run 28 races or something other. And it just weren't any fun to. Junior Johnson was about to head into uncharted territory to find out if he could use the same style he had used as a winning driver to be a successful car owner. And he up his steering wheel for the keys to the shop in Ingle Hollow and would set out to build a winning race team. He thrived at what lay ahead. Junior Johnson is as smart a man as I've ever met in my life. He may have only gone to the eighth or ninth grade, but this is a guy that got in with uh, uh, 
lords of American industry when he was negotiating sponsorship deals, and he more than held his own. His cars, uh, from the, the time in uh, the mid-60s that he quit driving himself until he quit as a car owner in 1995, were always uh, very, very competitive. Through the 60s and 70s, some of the sport's greatest drivers passed through Junior's organization. Names like Leroy Yarborough, Bobby Allison, Kel Yarborough, and eventually Darrell Walter found success with Junior's guidance. As a fellow driver, Johnson respected each of them. And he changed my whole attitude. Everything, everything I knew and everything I, I had done in the past uh, when I went to work for Junior, kind of like wipe all that out. We don't do it that way here. Uh, and, and, and I had to start all over again. And uh, of course, with winning comes credibility. And when you're driving for Junior Johnson at the time, you know, people kidded about being the company car. The Ingle Hollow Race Shop soon became a breeding ground for innovation. It was the place to work as a mechanic. The sport's best honed their skills there with little team turnover. I had a good system for young guys that I brought along. And I did never go in and jump on a guy over something he did wrong. I just show him what he did wrong because I wanted to do it right next time, not get mad at me and, and not listen to me. You know, uh, the period of times that you're working with somebody and you see development as time goes along that they had a part in. Uh, and you don't do no one thing by yourself. You gotta have uh, other people's ideals to bounce your ideals off from. And if they, you know, if you're sitting talking to somebody and you say, what do you think about this? And he said, I don't like that. Then you, if he don't like it, you just often wonder, well, why do I like it? And you get to analyzing the thing and, you, and figure out what's wrong and you go, in the direction to fix your problem. But uh, I've had some hey, I've had some great mechanics and they've proved to be great mechanics because they've went on to uh, be successful themselves and a lot of key people in my operation are still in are still in the bid. I think Junior had the appreciation of several aspects of it. He was a good businessman. He was probably one of the best mechanics in racing. He knew how and why things worked and, and uh, how to adjust them. If, if the driver could communicate with him, he could make the car better. He also knew how to hire people. I asked him one time, he had a stack of resumes up at the shop. And I said, Junior, what do you look for? I'm thinking mechanical degrees, welding, metallurgy, uh, physics. He said, honesty. Junior Johnson had all the pieces of a winner. Driver, crew member, equipment, sponsor, victory, all they could top off his success would be a championship. In the 70s, Cal Yarbrough got behind the wheel of Junior's car, instantly impressing the seasoned veteran. One of the things that I learned from, from Junior Johnson is he is, uh, he never was a give up guy. And uh, I learned that early uh, in my driving career with Junior. Uh, doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter if you get a lap down, or two laps down, or three laps down. You just don't ever give up. Uh, you, may, you may give out, but don't give up. He was uh, a monster talent, you might say. He did, I seen him do a lot of things with a car that I, I didn't think a human being could do. And he had uh, the knack for taking nothing and making something out of it. And I've seen that a lot. He's just an awesome person when it comes to not giving up. Started in 76, the johnson yarber combination would earn 20 wins and three championships in a row, derailing the reigning champion Richard Petty. He never got nose to nose or anything like that, you know what I mean? He will get you next week, you know, and he said under his breath it was never public or anything. They had won so many of them, and you basically, if you raced with them over the years, it was kind of uh, expected of them to win the championship, but uh, it wouldn't arrival of me to 
beat the pins. It was just something that I decided I'd go after. And uh, when I went after it, I put a lot of effort into making sure we got it. When we won three in a row, uh, I, it was a good accomplishment, but uh, I had no idea that it would still be a record. You know, when you got people like uh, that have won championships like the Petty, like uh, uh, Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Gordon and these guys and Darrell Waltrip and, and these guys, uh, you would think that somewhere along the line, as many as uh, that, that they won, somebody would have won three in a row. So it's uh, it's just amazing to me that that record uh, still stands. After the 1980 season, Garber decided to cut back on the schedule and departed Junior Stable. Johnson tagged the guy who had been the team's arch rival to drive, the very vocal Darrell Walford. I just felt like Darrell was as equal with Earnhardt, which is the two of us about the same, coming in about the same time. The only thing is their talents was different. Earnhardt was a slam bang, rough type driver, sort of like myself. And Darrell's a sort of, well, you reach back to the Tim Plot days and stuff, but he knew how to win races. And he was uh, as good as anybody was there when he wanted to put out and go up there to the front. I was just fortunate to be with Junior at the right time. I mean, we had to, it's when they downsized the cars from the big Monte Carlo, 115 inch wheelbase down to the 110 little Buick. I mean, the first year poor old Tim Brewer, we built, I know 20 race cars and he built most of them by himself under the direction of Junior and Banjo Matthews. But I had fallen into the best situation you could fall into. The combination clicked. Junior, Darrell and the entire team would end up winning three more championships in 1981, 1982 and 1985. We won 12 races, we won 12 poles, we won the Bush Clash, we won the championship. I mean, won everything. And, and, and I knew I would. Uh, I knew if I got in that 11 car with the people Junior had, the kind of cars he had, and as smart as he was, I knew that was, that was going to be the, the perfect situation for me. Junior Johnson was now a six-time champion. It was a long way from the moonshine runs of the 50s to the Waldo Pastoria in New York City. Junior Johnson had nothing left to prove. Sport headed in the 90s, Junior Johnson had been involved in racing for six decades. He was still winning races with Bill Elliott and Jimmy Spencer as drivers. In 1995, with a young family to enjoy, Junior made a tough decision to leave the sport he helped build. Racing was something that I kind of lost interest in, more or less. And uh, I had sold two of my race teams, and I had one more with Brent Bodine with Lowe's Home Improvement. And I said, well, if I can get rid of this team, I'll just sell everything, get plumb out of it. And I had some other businesses that I was looking after too. So uh, when the two kids come along and me and Lisa's starting us a new house and stuff, it, it, I just had so many other things I'd rather be doing than doing racing. My life's ten times better now than it was in racing. I enjoy my life now. I hadn't enjoyed it in a long, long time. The sport goes on without the last American hero as author Tom Wolfe coined him, but his legend and influence live on. A remarkable career, a remarkable personality. It still should stun everyone that this man, for all he had accomplished, for all he had done, was able, when the time was right, completely do an about face in his life, walk away from racing when he was still a contender, when he still could have won any given week, walked away from the whole thing and said, I've done my part. Just as uh, the author Tom Wolf called him, uh, Wolf called him the last American hero, I don't think he was the last one, but he was one of the great American heroes. And uh, his color and uh, Full bore attitude certainly propel, played a great part in propelling NASCAR where it is today. At the end, uh, Junior Johnson became one of the best friends and still is that I've ever had. He's sly like a fox. I mean, you know that the silver hair and and uh, 
and he comes across as, you know, uh, uh, almost like, uh, he didn't, like, like he doesn't know a whole lot, you know. But that man has got the sharpest mind even today. I've never done anything to hurt people, you know, start with. I've tried to hit it in every way I possibly could, or like getting the, the factories to do the stuff that they do and get into the sport of Ford, Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, all of them. I've worked with every one of them. I have given about as many sponsorships or helped work out as many sponsorships as I've had myself. I think I'm the one that got Chevrolet back into it. I know in, in the mid-60s, uh, from uh, they got out in 66 Ford and I went to Bill Francine and asked him to help you know in the motor side and stuff and I could get Ford back in I got them back into it through the process of doing things for them and I don't think Chevrolet would ever got back into it if I hadn't built a car that went to Charlotte sat on the pole and led the race there and then, I started running on my own with the 72 Chevrolet with, with uh, Bobby Allison. Whether I've helped it to the extent of what it looks like or not, I don't know. I just know I'm the only one that was doing it. And in the meantime, I was trying to help myself because I needed the help to, you know, to survive. NASCAR Winston Cup racing may miss him. But Junior Johnson is not one to look back. These days, Junior Johnson lives a contented life. He is a family man with two small children, Robert and Meredith, and a wife, Lisa. He tends to his various businesses, ranging from real estate to Junior Johnson Country Ham. The legend of Engel Hollow is thriving like never before. For the men behind the wrenches, I'm Jeff Hammond. Thanks for joining me.